Hello everyone, uh, my name is Kerry Davis and I am the Director at the Centre for Deliberative Research at NatSEN. Hi, and I'm Suzanne. I'm Director of Engagement at the Policy Institute at King's College London. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's the second in an ongoing informal seminar series, exploring a range of aspects to do both with the theory and the practice of deliberation. Just by way of introduction, um, through these seminars, we're hoping to provide a really informal, non-judgmental and conversational space for practitioners, for theorists, for policymakers, and just anyone who's interested in these approaches and ways of working to come together to listen to experts in their field talk about their perspectives on and also their experiences with deliberation as well as their reflections on what works and of course what could be better. So the conversations that we're having in these seminars are meant to be inclusive. We're talking about deliberation in the broadest sense. So not just the role that citizens assemblies, for example, can play, though that of course will be a part of it, but how we can use the full range of deliberative approaches to engage meaningfully with the public and policymakers on some of the most pressing social policy issues of our time, like for, like for instance, the climate crisis, which will certainly get covered today, and aspects of political polarisation. We'll also consider deliberation in the context of democracy, so those concepts and approaches which are tied to institutions and intended to influence or create change to policy and governments, as well as deliberation more as a research method used to explore questions and challenges that are not always derived from or embedded in actual policy questions. So we're going to be exploring a diverse set of topics, including issues related to inclusivity and deliberation, how it can be done well online, how deliberation can be used to help us identify and plan for problems of the future, never mind those we face today. We'll be looking at what's worked well, but also what might be next for deliberation and how we can keep things fresh. So we also want to hear from you. So we'd love it if you could get in touch and let us know what aspects of deliberation you'd like to see debated and we would do our best to help. Um, so in our first seminar, we went through an introduction to deliberation, what it is, why you might use it. And today we're focusing more on policy impact. We know you'll be dealing with pressing issues in the work that you do, so let us know what they are and we'll do our best to include them in this programme. Whatever the topic we end up talking about though, these conversations really aren't intended to be a how-to guide. Um, rather, we hope that what you hear today and in future seminars will encourage you to reflect on your own practice and also inspire you to try out new approaches. We also hope that it will help you develop a bit of a language, a bit of a shared language to talk to your clients, funders, commissioners about the value of these approaches. But more than anything else, we really hope to forge something of a community of practice. Everyone here today is here because they're intrigued by or they're grappling with the potential and the possibility these approaches can bring. And I think surely we can better realize that if we, if we work together and share what we found along the way. Today though, we're gonna be talking about policy impact. Impact. And this is such a live issue in deliberation. What's the real world difference that it actually makes? And if it doesn't lead to change, then does that mean it's failed? I think when people think about policy impact, then the Citizens Assembly in Ireland that led to constitutional reform in relation to abortion is the example that most people reach for, and, and rightly so. But there are plenty of other examples too, from national level decision making down to the hyperlocal. And let's assume that the latest bonfire in Westminster um, doesn't eat up the whole of the levelling up agenda, then there's going to be lots more to be said there, because so much of that agenda is predicated on people being more involved in decisions that shape their community and away from policy then what about all the other impacts that deliberation can have like the like the effect on participants of being involved in deliberative exercise does it change your views for the long term does it as Jane Mansbridge hypothesized does the process make you a better citizen more likely to try and shape decisions in the future so without any further hesitation um, for those of you that weren't here last time and if you weren't why not um, let us explain a little bit about how these seminars will work in each we're going to hear from a range of speakers and we will introduce them shortly, who will share their point of view before we respond to a series of questions. There's plenty of time for you to have your say as well. Please feel free to post your questions in the chat box, along with your name and your organisation, if you're willing to share, and we'll make sure we get round to them. So today we're delighted to be joined by three leading figures who we've all had the pleasure of working with in various roles. Firstly, we'd like to introduce Graham Smith. Uh, so Graham, if you're there, put your camera on. Professor of Politics at the University of Westminster. Graham is also the founding chair of the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies, funded by the European Climate Foundation. 
Graham's the author of Democratic Innovations, Designing Institutions for Citizen Participation, and some of his recent publications also include Democracy in a Pandemic, Participation in Response to Crisis, which was an open access collection edited with Involve. He's also worked tirelessly to promote democratic innovations. For instance, for instance, even, uh, you can hear him on the Reasons to be Cheerful podcast. And we're also welcoming um, Dr. Rod Dakem, Senior Lecturer in the Department of Political Economy at King's. Uh, Rod's expertise lies in democratic theory, particularly participatory and deliberative democracy. His book, Rethinking Civic Participation in Theory and Practice, was published in 2018. And he's a regular commentator on the media about these issues, as well as conspiracy theories and the state of the government more broadly. So he's been busy lately. Um, he's recently been away from King's working at the University of Oxford on a new project on conspiracy theories and democratic participation as a fellow at Keeble College and we're so happy to have him back and I go from one current colleague to a former one and last but by no means least by any stretch we're really delighted to have Michelle Mackey research director at Ipsos and head of their qualitative research and engagement center with us today. Michelle has designed and delivered more citizens assemblies, dialogues, deliberative workshops, citizens juries on that you can shake a foot at. I think you've given up more weekends than most uh, to the cause um, on a whole range of topics, including NHS reform, genome editing, COVID response, future of transport, you name it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing you share that, that kind of practical considerations and what you've learned along the way. So without any further hesitation on our part, um, over to you, Graham. Thank you so much. So um, I was asked to, we were asked to uh, kind of give a couple of examples of um, ex examples of assemblies or deliberative processes that have had, had impact. And the, I just want to mention three. The first one was obviously mentioned in the, in the talk, we have, uh, in the introduction, we have to talk about the Irish Citizens Assembly 2016 to 18. And I think this is kind of interesting because of the infrastructure that was put in place. So they put a special parliamentary committee in place, which looked at the outcomes of the assembly and then that committee fed into government. So it was kind of, we're gonna use the word later, it was institutionalized, it was embedded. Although actually that's not the whole story. It was embedded for climate change and it was embedded for abortion, but it wasn't embedded for fixed term parliaments. It wasn't for um, an aging population, which were also looked at by the assembly. So something we, we, we may pick up, but I think it's, the assembly is interesting for two reasons. One, because of what it did do and also one, what it didn't do. So. Uh, that's obviously my first one. And then I want to go local as well. So a couple that I've, uh, one I was involved in um, quite closely, the Waltham Forest Citizens Assembly on Hate Incidents, I think is really interesting. And the Kendall Climate Change Citizens Jury, which just happened recently. And for both of those, uh, what really struck me about the impact of those was the way in which um, council officers and civil servants were, were brought into the process. Right at the start, they were involved in the in the governance arrangements, and you could actually see the impact coming to bear as the assembly progressed, rather than it happening at the end. So for me, the, the ones that are always striking for me are the ones where broader infrastructure has been, has, has been created around the assembly. And so the, the, the three I mentioned, are Irish Citizen Assembly, Kendall and Waltham Forest. Thank you so much. I think that point about infrastructure is is really, really interesting and, and also about bringing people with you on the journey on your way, you know, because we're working often with commissioners who don't have experience of these methods or approaches and building that trust and building their knowledge as you go through the process, um, I think is is really helpful. So, and we'll definitely pick up on these in the questions. But now I think over to to Rod, um, who's going to share some some thoughts as well. Thanks. Yeah. So what I'm going to say is going to sound gloomy to start with, but I promise you, ultimately, it's going to be a message of hope. I am. Um, it's very difficult to talk about um, all deliberative democratic innovations because of the sheer diversity of the kind of things we've been talking about. Um, I'm not, conversely, in fact, completely ignoring the, the brief I was given, going to talk about um, specific examples for a really good reason, right, which is I'm very interested not in finding examples of policy output or outcome within specific cases, but in general, and the kind of questions I'm interested in are, in broad terms, do deliberative democratic innovations have these kinds of output effects? 
So when we talk about these things, there are two broad categories of outcome that, we're, outcome that we're talking about, right? One we might think about as direct outcomes. These are the things that have an effect, just like Suzanne said, on the people who take part. So it might be developing a greater degree of knowledge. It might be um, a higher level of tolerance or trust in the work of public agencies, or ultimately a level of satisfaction in the work of the democratic innovation that they've taken part in, right? So that's one side. The other side is indirect outcomes. Now these aren't felt by participants. So there might be something like a broader degree um, of legitimacy of public decision-making based on the inclusion of uh, deliberative democratic innovations. But equally, it might be a direct influence over policy outcomes. These are all the kinds of things that um, deliberative democratic innovations could do. So to look at these, it's pretty easy to find examples of this with a specific case, but there's very relatively limited knowledge um, of how this kind of these things work across all deliberative democratic innovations. So we're doing a piece of work on a thing called Participedia, which if you don't know it, you really should. It's an online resource, it's a repository, which is open source of um, cases of democratic innovations. It is fantastic. Um, I was looking proviso specifically at citizens' assemblies, um, and it would be interesting to talk about these findings in the context of other things, right? We had a sample of like 300 citizens' assemblies. Um, it looks at them for evidence of direct and indirect outputs. Three very quick findings. And I'll talk about things we could do about it later on because I'm going to wrap up time. First finding, there was very limited evidence of any output at all from the cases on Participedia. Now, this, I suspect, is not to do with the fact that there was no output, right? It's just to do with the way that the, the evidence data was presented. So we'll push that to one side for a second. Um, second output, uh, second finding is that there is re relatively limited evidence for any form of indirect output. Like there isn't much out there that says that there's a direct policy effect. Now, this could do uh, could be to do with the way that evaluation works with citizen assemblies. I think there's a conversation to be had about how we interrogate what happened afterwards. It's also to do with the fact that like demonstrating policy effects, demonstrating influence is just tricky and difficult and actually to talk about ways that we might do that. Um, the other thing to say is that there is a relatively strong body of evidence to say that there, these direct outputs, the effects on the participants does take place. Most obviously the people who take part in citizens assemblies really like it. Yeah, they are generally very satisfied. Um, and there's quite a decent body of evidence to say that they're more knowledgeable about the area that they're getting involved in as well. Now I'm gonna leave it there. And I know that we're gonna kind of come on and talk about the implications of this later on, but that's. That's all I wanted to say. That's great. And I think that point about the impact on participants is and, and the enjoyment you know, is, is really important. And it's great to have raised that. But Michelle, it'd be lovely to hear um, reflections from you. And then Graham, if you're OK with it, we'll come back to you um, just for some more insights, if that's all right. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, so I'm going to talk about one example. Um, which I feel has certainly had demonstrable impact on policy and um, hopefully you'll understand and see why shortly. So almost three years ago, um, in August 2019, Ipsos undertook uh, the start of a programme of deliberative engagement with Londoners, so it was a local example, on behalf of the One London Local Health and Care Record Exemplar, or LICRA. Two of the directors at ICHP, Amy Darlington and Mark Hewley, were employed on behalf of uh, One London to run the engagement. And actually now Ipsos has a partnership uh, with ICHP to run deliberative engagement concerning health and care data. So we, um, we had our own sort of impact um, as a result of working with a client and we now work together. Um, so with support from the King's Fund and also Professor Graham Smith, um, we designed a two weekend process. A hundred members of the public were informed about health and care data and how it can be used if better joined up, as well as the apparent risks in doing so. They discussed these uses at length and they were helped by real life case studies and interactions with experts as well from across the system, deliberated the trade-offs. And on the final day, 100 people were split into four groups with roughly 25 people taking, um, developing uh, recommendations in one particular policy area. These were drafted and fed back to the group and then redrafted based on the group's whole group's feedback. 
Um, 100 people then uh, electronically voted their level of support for the four sets of recommendations. And the final recommendations were presented by the panel, um, by sorry, by participants to the panel, um, which was a panel of senior health and care leaders, politicians, um, who then responded with their commitments around how they were going to take these forward. Um, so the, re the work has been really hugely um, impactful and influential in terms of influencing the policy development um, in London. There are lots of ways in which it's done so, but I'll just name a few. So previously, um, this is, sounds mad to say it, but there were many healthcare professionals who were nervous on behalf of their patients about sharing health and care data across health services and across geographical boundaries. There were clear expectations from citizens, shocked to learn that their healthcare records would not necessarily be accessible if they ended up in a hospital outside of the borough that they lived in. And this meant that um, across London, the London care record has now been implemented. So um, putting aside nerves, um, people now um, are reassured to know that this is an expectation um, within patients and the public. Um, and the system has a mandate from the public to make sure that healthcare records are available at the point of care, um, which saves efficiencies, the need for patients to repeat their story twice and also saving lives. Um, another uh, expectation was that citizens um, expressed that the public should be continue to be involved in policy development. And recently, the London system has undertaken further engagement supported by Ipsos and ICHP to inform a more sort of detailed development of the data infrastructure. And these recommendations will be acted upon in the not too distant future. So if I was going to list the ingredients for success for this work, and it is one of the most successful pieces of work that I've been involved in, and why it has had such a great impact on influence in policy, I would make these three points. So firstly, it was an example of public engagement around downstream policy development, meaning that decision makers were, were ready to get on with this work, using the outputs from the public deliberation. In fact, they proved very vital in the context of the pandemic, which happened literally following this engagement. Um, so they had that mandate from the public and they had the conditions that were, um, were expressed in terms of expectations around how data was going to be used going forward. Secondly, the decision makers were willing to put jeopardy on the table from the start. Um, data sharing is a very contentious topic. Um, there's a lot of sort of lack in trust in how data is used and lots of kind of worries about data being sold or misused. And the decision makers definitely didn't get all of the answers that they expected, but they were willing to put the cards on the table and listen. Um, and the system responded one year later with a You Said We Did blog and also an event that they invited all 100 people back to, um, hence showing the accountability in relation to implementing the recommendations. The third point is around the fact that the decision makers were heavily involved in the process throughout to the points that have just been made. Um, they were very engaged and they did a lot of work across the system to make sure that people were aware that this work was going on. Um, the process was supported by a fundamental oversight group with representatives from all of the relevant bodies um, and also involve and made, made confidential bringing sort of participatory methods and patient voice to the table too. Finally, it's just worth saying that um, I think another thing that has contributed to the success is that it's incredibly transparent. So all of the materials, the presentations, the citizens' recommendations, videos of them presenting that back to the panel are available on a, on a website. And the work has therefore been cited and, and publicised really sort of all over the place. It's been cited in national policy documentation and quoted in various documents as a gold standard form of engagement. That's all for me for now. Thanks, Michelle. I think those practical reflections are really helpful. And, and certainly that point about transparency, about making sure that the materials are available. So it's not just useful for the client, but for the wider, wider society, the public, other funders, uh, incredibly helpful points. Graham, I'm just going to come back for you for some, for some additional um, views as well. well. I started jumping ahead of myself. I was <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention something which I complete, which I, um, which is a, um, a, docu a, a report that was just published by the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies by uh, Eva Rovers and Eve Dajier, um, which we asked them to look at the key drivers of impact. Uh, this was in climate assemblies, but I think it's more generally. And they came after having done a lot of engagement with um, workshops, et cetera, with, with people within the network and elsewhere, they came up with three factors. One was getting the question right. 
no point running something if you if you don't if you don't get the question right. The second, and this fits in with what Michelle and I think Rod was saying, was um, that the commissioner sets the right mandate and within that is clear about what the follow up is. What are they going to do with this? And the third, and this is an interesting one, what, which uh, is the comm strategy, getting the comm strategy right. And I, I think that's a really interesting one, which we probably don't think about enough and is usually an afterthought. So for them, it was the question, the mandate and follow up and comm strategy. And those were the things that really drove impact from the cases that they were looking at. Thank you. So um, a series of kind of fascinating reflections to get us started in thinking about deliberation and policy impact. Um, and before we hear from the audience, as Suzanne explained at the beginning, we take our kind of co-chair's privilege of asking uh, the panellists a couple of questions each before widening it out. Um, so that's that's how this works. Um, my first question was going to be um, uh, asking you all, Graham's laughing because you've done this already, uh, to talk us through examples of impact that you think are most striking. And Graham, as you've sort of done that, Michelle, you used an example of impact to really help draw attention to a series of lessons. So perhaps I could just ask you a slightly amended question, and this is to you all. Um, I was struck by one of the points uh, that you were making, Rod, that demonstrating effects is tricky. So even though we've seen examples of impact that you've all sort of um, ha had um, either enjoyed or been able to point to some of the lessons from, I wonder if perhaps I could ask you a slightly different question, which is thinking about an example of impact that you think is most striking. Um, what, what did it kind of best demonstrate or what was, um, you know, what's my question? There's something about, do you, if you were to be able to evaluate impact of the example that you're thinking about, you know, what would be the things that you'd be looking to, to see? What do we need to look for? So even though we've heard some examples of what good impact looks like, um, if we were to, yeah, have a think about those examples that you really like or that are really striking to you, what would you look for in them? What would you be expecting to see in the deliberation that you would think could, could correlate to some form of impact, direct or indirect, in the ways that Rod's already outlined? So yeah, just to have a go at that. And if it doesn't make sense, I'm happy to try and rephrase it again. But Graham, do you want to go first and then we'll whip round? Sure. sure, the thing that actually came to my mind is I said, yeah. so, you know, the kind of, if you like, inverted commas, the gold standard, if you like, where we're working with, and I think, which is, you know, which is you run your assembly, you get policy change. You know, that's what most people have in their mind. And some sort of crazy, very simple idea that the moral force of these citizens will change the whole policy making process, which is, you know, absolute madness to think that one intervention can change can change everything. But I think that the, the thing that I'm going to slightly change it, the thing that I think we ought to be looking more at, which we don't look at, which I think Rod, Rod may have something to say about, is the way that running a deliberation changes the culture of a commissioning organisation and the way that it does things. So I think one of the interesting things for me is having run an assembly, do you want to run another one? Um, and does this become part of the every, and we're going to maybe pick this up towards the end anyway, it, does this become the everyday way of doing things? Have, has the assembly changed the perception of public engagement amongst those people who were involved? It doesn't mean they run another assembly because it's not always the thing you should be doing. There are other way, other things you'd be doing as well. But for me, and that's really, really hard to capture. And, and in most impact evaluations isn't captured, but, it's that, but for me, it's about changing the practices and the cultures of the of the commissioning body and other stakeholders around it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Rod or Michelle, uh, other reflections on that? Go for it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Just to pick up on Graham's point, which I think is a really good one, is that um, I mean, there's two two parts to this, right? The first is that policy impacts aren't always clear or linear, so there might be value in having uh, a democratic innovation which is aimed at doing one very specific thing. And they're often kind of controversial or difficult topics are ad addressed by these things, right? But it also has an effect elsewhere. So the policy effect might not um, be related to even its original intention, but as Graham says, it might be some kind of cultural change in the way that um, uh, citizen participation is viewed. And that development of institutionalization is very difficult to pick up. Um, in an evaluation. The other thing, the, the more simple answer is, of course, that you um, you might not have an effect within the lifetime of your evaluation, right? If you only can do it within a couple of months of the completion of the, say, the Citizens' Assembly, and it doesn't happen for another year, you're not going to be able to talk confidently about it. So I think there are real challenges in evaluation and how we demonstrate these effects that aren't always it's the obvious ones. 
Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, I think I'm probably just picking up on that last point, actually. I think it's really easy for me to talk about the One London um, example because um, the system was kind of, as I said, really ready to 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 to, um, to start implementing the recommendations. So um, even one year on, there is kind of you know a list of what 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 you said and what we did and and what we're still working on. Um, so it's really sort of uh, actionable, and it's also not sort of you're not waiting for things to happen. I think with some. Um, some of the citizens assemblies we've been involved in around climate and local councils, um, that's much more of a longer term vision and a longer term plan. And so I guess you wouldn't be able to do that a year later. You wouldn't be able to sort of go back and say, OK, what have we done and what haven't we done and why? Um, and so um, I think that can be really challenging for some of these processes, especially where the um, involvement of the public comes much, um, much sort of more sort of upstream. Um, and, you know, this is a, a, a policy that will be in development over many, many years. Thank you, everyone. Really, really interesting things. I'm kind of interested, too, um, to learn about your reflections on on the barriers um, to deliberative processes having impact and, and what specifically as practitioners we can change to overcome this. And, and hopefully it's not just the kind of inverse of, of some of the things you've already mentioned, like, you know, or we just need to, you know, get the question right or have a clear mandate and be transparent. Are there other things that we need to be doing around the edges to make sure that we can have an impact in this kind of work? That's a free for all. Whoever wants to go first, Michelle. I'll jump in again, if you yeah, like. please. For me, for me, it, it is almost the inverse of what I've been saying. But it is about pre pre preparing. Let's assume we're working with a public authority. It could be it could be anybody on anybody else. But actually, spending time preparing the public authority for the deliberative exercise. Mm -hmm. um, tenders usually just specify deliver this assembly, uh, and I think as practitioners, we should be pushing. Um, we should be pushing um, sponsors and, and commissioners to actually provide culture change funding um, and kind of provide uh, funding for you to actually do work. It might not be the same organisation, might be a different organisation, but be able to do work within the public authority to actually make sure that this lands. So for me, it's not a surprise. I, I, I was in a, in a workshop the other day where someone said, you know, some, for some of my colleagues, the first time they know about an assembly is when the is is when this report lands on their desk, and they go, "What? What? What the hell? You know? And, and why should I listen to this group of fifty or hundred citizens? I've not been involved in this. I don't know. You know? Then they're not prepared for it. And so I think that that question of how we how we prepare um, a public authority or a private sector uh, commission or whatever for this to land is just as critical. And we don't do that work. We're typically not we're not funded for that work. But I think it's absolute absolutely critical. It's a really interesting point, isn't it? If I think about some of the evaluation work that I do and have done, then, then so much of that, you know, you're going into an organisation to evaluate what they're doing and so much of it is about laying the ground. You're working collaboratively with them on theory of change, you're building capacity to help them gather the information that they need to provide to you. It's a much more, I wonder, yeah, I wonder if there's things that we can learn from other spaces, but, but anyone else that wants to come in on, on barriers? I just want to jump in on uh, a point Graham made earlier on about comm strategy, which I had heard but completely forgot about when I was doing this piece of work. And I think it's, it is really important, right? Um, and the example that illustrates it for me is this. There's, um, everybody talks about the Irish Citizens Assembly and the use of a referendum to kind of reinforce um, and, and give legitimacy to, uh, to the outcomes of a Citizens Assembly, right? But in British Columbia, and this was a few years ago now, they had a citizens' assembly on electoral reform, which went to a referendum and was widely rejected, right? Um, and this, there is quite a few cases that I've come across um, of this. And I wonder if it's to do with communication. So there's a guy at King's, Damien Bolt, who did a paper recently on widespread public knowledge and acceptance um, of citizens' assemblies. Um, and basically that is almost zero. Like nobody really knows about these things apart from people like us, right? Um, there must be something about communicating this work, about getting it out there that can have, um, have an impact. Thank you. And Michelle, anything from you on, on, on barriers? Um, I think I would probably echo uh, Graham's points around sort of um, getting the right stakeholders involved right from the start. Um, I think whenever I work with systems, I um, 
make that quite upfront in terms of we expect you to be involved. We expect you to be present at the engagements with the public. We expect you to be, um, you know, informing design meetings. We, you know, it's almost like this is, you know, this is your work. You haven't just kind of given it to us to get on with. You've got to be a part of it. And I think that's where um, these processes can be really successful when that happens. And obviously something like health and care data in London isn't just the NHS, it's the uh, you know, local authority side, care homes, social care as well. And we, we um, well, the client actually engaged the, the, the mayor and, and you know, all the right people right from the start, which um, really did help with the receptiveness of the recommendations within the system. Makes sense. Um, uh, Suzanne and I were chatting about this, and obviously deliberation is something that's used globally in different countries, in different governmental systems. And I wondered if any of you had any reflections on what we might be learning from these other places and examples with respect to impact, um, again, in, in the sort of broadest possible sense. Um, Michelle, let's put you on the spot, but I wonder if you might want to, to reflect first on that and maybe we'll reverse the order on the panel this time. I'm, I'm probably the least uh, the least kind of clued up in this area um, compared to our professors who uh, would, would probably have more to say. Um, I guess... Um, you know we are we we are always looking at practice internationally um and um looking at you know examples of what went well and, and why um i'm con- continuously interested in learning but i haven't had as much kind of direct impacts mostly working in the uk context yeah okay yeah and then rod how about for you especially with your the recent review that you were mentioning you must yeah clearly that was a kind of global effort so I'm so sorry, Kerry. You, you broke up just as you were asking the question. Can you oh, go over it again? Of course, of course. I was just saying that, you know, so deliberation is something that's used globally. It's happening in lots of different countries and lots of kind of government uh, in different governmental systems. So I wonder if there's what can we learn from some of these different countries, some of these different examples with respect to impact? Do we see anything distinctly different? Um, yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you. Um, so this was really interesting. So the sample of cases that I've got are rooted primarily in the UK, Canada and the States, but there are examples from over 70 countries, like in almost every context you can think of. What's really interesting is that as far as I can tell, um, there isn't a huge difference in terms of uh, the way these things play out, right? The issues to do with institutionalization, the issues to do with um, designing evaluation from the outset, those are the critical ones, right? And the theme that, you know, it is difficult to demonstrate the kind of impact that we're talking about seem, does seem to be a universal thing, but I'm really interested to hear anybody else's thoughts on this. Yeah, yeah. Graham, how about you on that, on that question? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is one of the reasons that the Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies was, was, was actually developed to try and learn from um, play, other places, not just on impact, but also on commissioning and um, design and implementation. And I think that one of the lessons we've learned, um, and of course, there's a big debate about how tightly you should couple assemblies with, with public authorities, etc. But if, if your ambition is to have policy change, then um, the, and it seems completely obvious, but actually running it in relation at the right time in relation to the policy cycle seems to be quite helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And many assemblies seem to be run uh, at the whim of a particular you know political leader or whatever and not necessarily take into account where and when decisions can be made so i think an interesting case for example is in um denmark where they've run their climate assembly and it's actually part of the 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 the, the um legislative process they 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 run it as part of their annual climate policy planning process so it actually feeds into it, 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 in principle, it, its recommendations come out at a time when it's useful for civil servants and politicians because that's what they're dealing with. It's a very instrumental way of using assemblies. And I've, I've got no, I've, I have no problem with that. There are other ways of using assemblies. So I think in terms of if it's about policy impact you're interested in, then that, then that, then that seems to be key. If we're thinking about broader social impact, etc., then, then there are other things at play. <laughs> Of the local assemblies in the UK around climate have been run without much thinking about where the decision cycle is. So, so I, th- I think that's really key. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and Suzanne, this links well. It does. It does. It just follows on to something I wanted to pick up with you, um, Graham, specifically, which is why climate has been such a successful area for deliberation. Do you get a sense that it's the kind of commissioners, or is it you know the immediacy of 
the challenge. You know, we're, we're in a climate crisis and 40 degrees last week. Everyone knows we're in a climate crisis now. Is it or is it the kind of is it the way that they come together? Just interested in your reflections, because there have been so many. And my, my, my first thought is to push back on your question about whether they've been successful or not. <laughs> a lot of them. If you mean, do you mean that we as practitioners are getting lots of tenders for them? Then, <laughs> but, but but you know, so I actually don't think they've been that successful. Many of them, um, um, and and I'll explain why I think that's the case. I think there's a number of issues here. One is yes, it's a crisis. You just mentioned it is a crisis, it, and and. I think a lot of people, a lot of um, political actors know they need to act and aren't sure what, what to do. Um, and I think are reaching out for ways of dealing with this. And I think Extinction Rebellion have played a role in this in terms of raising the profile of the climate crisis, but also of, of citizens assemblies as a, as a potential um, solution to it. I think a lot of local authorities, for example, declared climate emerg emergencies and then went, oh, now what do we do? Oh yeah, next on the list, climate assembly. Um, and that, so I think there's a kind of sense in which I, I don't want to say that's always the case. I think there's some I, I think we can find examples of people who are really motivated in local authorities to really make change. But there's also a sense of, oh, it's the fashion. It's what other people are doing. We better run. What do we do now? Oh, yeah, they, they ran an assembly over there. We, I want one of those, too. I want to be able to go to that next meeting of the LGA and say I ran an assembly as well. I want to be in that club. So I think there's a mixture of motives um, going on here. And again, I think that, that there is actually, I've had this conversation with a few people, I have some concerns. So on a positive note, we're learning about what works well and we hope mm. that in the, if there is a next generation, they can be better. The danger is that the climate assemblies, there's so many of them, they don't have the impacts we want and that actually undermines the model completely. And I'm not just talking about climate assemblies, I'm talking about citizens assemblies as well. So there's a real danger that, that the climate, I can see why so many people want to run them some of those motivations, I'm not sure, are great motivations. Um, and so it's a bit of a mixed bag, if I'm honest, Susan. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you very much. And um, a specific question now for you, Rod. Um, so you've obviously done recently done this review of projects on Participedia. Um, what were some of the most surprising things that you found when trying to investigate policy or impact in general? Yeah. Um, yeah. So and instead, I have a, a quick sidebar, which is. I'm going on, on what you said just now. So some of the least successful cases in the sense that evaluation has been done and there was no clear pathway to policy impact, if that's what we're interested in, right, were very localised um, examples of climate assemblies. So they were based at kind of neighbourhood, local authority level, but dealing with issues which are obviously kind of global and there was no clear connection there. And, and I think it's obvious why that is. So I just wanted to kind of chip in and, and, and support you there. Um, in terms of the surprise, so I wasn't surprised, I think, and I suppose many of us um, probably wouldn't be by the lack of data on policy impacts, the lack of evidence there, uh, for all of the reasons that we've said, right? I was surprised um, by some of these direct outcomes, the effects on participants, which is really big in the literature. It's at the root of you know, all of the theory, if you're interested in this stuff, on deliberative democracy. But it wasn't just the satisfaction um, uh, data that was interesting, right? So it wasn't just that people really liked these things. It was that there was evidence that they're actually learning both about um, the specific topic they're dealing with, but also about these processes of participation. And there is some evidence there to suggest that if you are going to take part in a, um, a citizen's assembly or some other form of deliberative democratic innovation, you're going to leave it much more likely, or at least kind of describing yourself as being much more likely to do some other form of participation. So actually there's, there is evidence to, um, to support all of those effects on kind of democracy in general, which I found was really interesting and quite surprising. Thank you. Okay, and Michelle, it'd be really helpful to get your reflections as a practitioner. So what have, your, what have been your most constructive experiences of working with policymakers for impact and, and what, what can we learn from? So I think, um, the, the the first point is around um, the decision makers kind of willingness to um, to sort of understand and engage what they've signed up for um, and what that really means. So to, to Graham's point, um, everybody is talking about deliberation at the moment. It's the sexy thing on the block. And I come across, you know, commissioners having conversations with them where they they say it's what they want to do. but They don't even really know what it is. 
And so the, the best examples are where the decision makers really understand what they're signing up for. They can put they can give you the right inputs and they can get the right outputs. So not just PR exercises um, and, and trying to get the win hearts and minds uh, through the process. And um, that's the first point. And then the second one is kind of linked to that, the willingness to put the jeopardy on the table, um, nerve wracking as that must be. Um, particularly where it's a, a controversial or, or a difficult um, area to work through with the public where there are going to be winners, there are also going to be losers um, and um, empowering people to feed in to feed into that um, via these kind of exercises um, and not shying away from, from that and, and sort of being open to what you might get back. Um, I think we like we, we, we reassure sort of commissioners by saying you, know, you don't have to necessarily do everything that is recommended, but you need to be able to respond to it to say how you've listened and what you what you, you know what you will take on board, what you are willing to take or are able to take on board. So those are the sort of best experiences, I think, when you have that kind of um, relationship with a commissioner. I think some really interesting reflections there, Michelle. I think um, that point about you, you kind of got to be open to vulnerability, right? And, and giving up power and being quite prepared for really unexpected things to happen and for the debate to take uh, take a course that you don't expect. And, and definitely, definitely hear you on, on, you know, clients want to do it. And it goes back to what Graham was saying, I guess, about climate as well, want to do it, don't necessarily know what it is. You know, I'm sure we've all, lots of practitioners on the call will have had a brief that says, you know, I want a citizens assembly by next month, please. And here's 10 grand, good luck. <laughs> and it's like, I can't do that. You don't get it. Um, so thank you for that. I'm kind of conscious that I want to bring in, uh, we want to bring in the, um, the audience now. And, and I think some of that does speak to points about cost as well. And there was there was a, a question from Bo, Bo Priestley about, you know, how, how do you present, you know, these cost a lot, we can't get away from it, they take time, they take effort, there's a lot of resources involved. How do you best present ROI to a client? Michelle, you do this all the time. I do. And I suppose um, there's something around um, explaining what you won't get from other methodologies I mean this these kind of methodologies that you know sit within a whole range of public engagement exercises from carrying out surveys you know brush straight kind of surveys across populations to doing qualitative interviewing and and focus groups and 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 you know sort of more research-led methodologies um I think you know we we have to explain why and how this is different and um, and explain the processes in terms of that kind of informing, deliberating, recommending, recommendation forming and, you know, everything that happens in between, that's not, it's not going to take two hours, it can't take two hours, um, it's going to take time um, with the public and it's also going to take a lot of time to, to develop and, and to design it and to bring all the stakeholders on board with, with you in doing that. Um, I think... Um, if there is a really, really low financial budget attached to an exercise, then I probably don't even continue to read it because, you know, that, that I'm not going to going to sort of do injustice to these methodologies by doing something really quick and dirty. And I think there is a risk that it is there's it's going to go that way because of like you know tight um, purse strings, etc., and um, the need to um, the need to make savings. But this is not cheap, and it can't be done quickly yeah I think maintaining that quality threshold is a, a really important point so I think there's also a question here from Julian uh, McRae who asks um, uh, any thoughts on how deliberative methods can influence policy development outside the scope of state institutions so not least for example those that feed into opposition agendas so you're right Julian we've been talking very much about those things which are being commissioned by people who are kind of currently in a position to do so um so yeah any thoughts from the panel on that um how might they uh, how might liberty methods influence policy development outside of the scope of the current sort of state institution who wants to have a crack at that go for it Graham I don't want to tell Julian how to do his job because this is what he's doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But, um, but uh, maybe that's why he's asking. It's good, you know, good inspiration. Checking it out. No, no. I mean, it's been, it's been interesting that an assembly was run by um, civil society organisations in Germany, um, a national assembly, and it, 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 with its 
pure focus of trying to affect the um, election and debates around climate during the election, and then also for the formation of the um, the formation of the new government. You know, they they specifically targeted that. Um, and we're seeing, I'm, I'm having more and more inquiries from organizations who, um, you know, so I, I was talking the other day, there's, a, there's an organization called Safe Landing that wants to run a, um, an assembly of workers within the, within the aviation industry in order to start talking about just, just transition. So I think people are starting to think about these methods as not being just the methods that are used by um, governments and are used by, um, you know, are used by sort of uh, traditional political institutions. Um, in terms of being used by opposition, it's kind of interesting. I had this debate with with uh, Extinction Rebellion when they first started because they were talking about some of the people involved at the top of Extinction Rebellion said we should we should organise our own climate assembly. And you know, the idea that XR would, would run a climate assembly, you know, in terms of all the questions of independence, et cetera. So I think there's some really interesting questions about how, how these are used strategically and ensuring that when they are used by political opposition or even or, or governments or whatever, that we can actually show that they have been run well, they've been run independently, they've been run transparently. Uh, there is a danger that these things become tools of campaigning and you know and, and we all know how those, that those methods these methodologies can be used in that way so so there are there are i think i, I haven't answered julian's question precisely but what i'm what is interesting is how people in other political spaces and political with a with a with a small p are starting to use these within within with perhaps in areas we, we wouldn't have imagined and i think that's a that's that's a lack of our thinking because we we typically tend to think the client is government or the public authority and, and I think there are all sorts of places across society where deliberation of all forms would be would, would, would be really helpful to, to break deadlocks to break you know to, to deal with really knotty knotty um, knotty issues. Yeah, no, thank you, Graham. And I think that the other thing that that sparked for me as well is this idea around um, if you're if you're working outside systems or state systems, there are questions of independence that we find easier to tackle when we're working within state systems, where we assume that independence can be. You know, so there's a question there about kind of what constitutes that sort of independent transparency, um, and can we assume that that is the case even when you know kind of people are, are, are commissioning this even within sort of state infrastructures? So that's just raised an additional thought there for me. Um, I don't know if anyone else on the panel has got uh, any thoughts on, on the idea of kind of working outside systems, otherwise we can move on to the next question. There are quite a few. Anyone feeling strongly about it? No? Okay, so I'm going to go to the next question. Oh, sorry, Suzanne, do you want to? No, you go. Okay, go on. Uh, which is from um, Emily Casriel, who's asked again, I think this is, goes back to some of what you were saying, Rod, earlier on about direct and indirect impacts. Um, is there any research, do we know of any research or any practice which is looking at deliberation and social cohesion? So the impact of deliberative processes on participants in terms of how they relate to people who think differently to them, which you may well encounter in, in deliberative processes. Michelle, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, was, I mean, it's not it's not necessarily research that I'm going to refer to, but within every single process, we capture this. So through sort of uh, evaluation questionnaires and, and possibly interviews with uh, participants after the event as well. Um, we uh, unsurprisingly note it down as well throughout every single discussion where people just say it's been really interesting talking to people who are, who are not the same as me and being mixed with different groups and hearing different perspectives. Um, so um, I think there should be more work in this area in terms of the impact of being exposed to different views on people's own views. And we always say, you know, think, as, think and act as citizens, not just individuals, but how that actually contributes to what, what the, how they think and what they do as part of the process, I think would be really interesting. Because I think it is hard for people to step outside of their own shoes on, you know, these issues that we often take to them. Agreed. And Rod? Yeah, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so but this is one of the, the fundamental questions that researchers working in this field um, talk about, right? So does engaging in deliberation in general affect how you think? And the whole point is, of course, that I'm going to be persuaded by your, your better argument, right? I'm going to change my mind. Um, but it's not just about the specific issue at hand. It's about um, more broadly how I view you as somebody who thinks differently to me, how I engage with society, all of these things, right? And so, yeah, there's quite a bit of work done on it. 
Um, often it's um, like micro deliberations. So it's analyses of how we interact. I think, um, I think there are probably, I'll have to maybe put it up in the chat afterwards, um, some examples of analysis that look at this in terms of specific um, democratic innovations. Graham might have some, some examples to add to it as well. But yeah, definitely this is something that people look at. Just conscious of time, if people are okay, we'll just take another couple of questions from the chat before we bring things to a close. Um, but I think just picking up on some of these things, Luke Redmond's put in the chat and it picks back up on what you were saying earlier, Graham, about institutionalization. Um, and he's commented that we're really trying to change a cultural approach to being led by the public rather than leading the public. So what can we do to make this more mainstream? question um, <laughs> um you you were uh, yeah I'm not, I'm not sure I've, i was thinking you were going to ask me about institutionalization then you changed well and topic no it's, it's fine it's fine because i just on that because i think institutionalization is just because something is repeated doesn't mean it's embedded mm -hmm. i think actually what we need to be looking at is embedding rather than institutionalizing i think there's a, there is a difference um but in terms of, so, so I, I've been noticing a couple of people have said this, there's a, there's a kind of, um, refer, and I saw Perry refer to sort of citizens juries in the 1990s, and some of us were old, are old enough to remember that that, you know, that wave and what, is this, an, is this another wave? And I think that's, that, that's a danger thing. I think there's a real, there's a really important um, thing that Michelle mentioned, which is, it's really important to, to, to stand up and sometimes say, this, you know, citizens assemblies are the wrong thing to be doing. Or, they, or, or citizens juries are the wrong thing to be doing in response to this. And have, being able to have that, there's a danger of a sort of advocacy, citizens assembly is the answer to everything. And I think that's really a mistake and that we need to, those of us who are involved in this field need, need to just have more mature and more nuanced conversations with people, recognizing that there are real times when assembly methodology is, is, is the right methodology. And there are times when it's the, it, it's the you know, it's the wrong answer to the question. You know, the question hasn't been asked, actually, the answer, they've just given me the answer. So, so for me, um, I, I think it's really hard to think about how we get broader conversations about this, unless you have something like the Irish situation, where, where you just have something that, that captures the, the public imagination. I think the same thing happened in France, but more negatively around the convention. And I think until we have those sorts of things being seen I remember a conversation with um, the guy who runs Mass uh, LBP in um, in Canada, where he was saying there will come a point soon in Canada where most people will know somebody who got an invite to a to to a citizens panel because they're becoming so prevalent. And that point when people go, "Oh, I had an invite to that," as well, you know what I mean. And actually, it becomes a topic of we're still in this country. It looks as though we've got a bit of a wave. Yes, we have. You know, made twenty or thirty ran last year or whatever that's still not that many it's still a really marginal and niche practice um we sometimes talk about it as if it's kind of taking over everything but it, but it clearly isn't so i think it's it's really difficult we've got to have those mature conversations and i also think we we need these kind of big set piece ones which actually have an effect for it to actually become something that resonates throughout the system and it's not just a kind of set of of niche practices thank you and i think that's that big... sorry about that no, I think that point on maturity and uh, a nuanced conversation is is so important. I don't know if anyone else wants to come in um, on that on that point. I can, if you like. Um, I really agree with uh, with Graham, and I think I often have like starting conversations with commissioners, um, almost like this is a check to make sure you want to proceed with this. And we we I talk about things like three tests. And there, you know, I can't think of all of them, but one of them is, does the public have a genuine opportunity to influence the outcome here? Um, you know, what are the trade-offs that you're, what, what are the trade-offs here? Um, what are the options um, and how, and you know, are they able to weigh in on these and influence that? And at that point, <laughs> some people do sort of sit back in their seat and think, okay, maybe we haven't thought this through. Um, and we've actually stopped one recently because we've had that precise conversation. So we've, I've said to them, I'd advise that we don't go ahead and we haven't. Um, and now they're thinking about what they're gonna do instead. Um, so it is really important um, for us to be educating as part of this work. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to jump in on that, I mean, doing these, um 
for the right reasons and in the right way, I think, just as you say, Michelle, is very simple. So one of the things that um, kind of, so we talked a lot, I talked a lot about the sense of satisfaction that participants get from engaging in them. Where their policy recommendations are completely ignored, or it's just not clear what's happening, there's um, a sense of frustration coming through some of the evaluations as well. You know, one of the great things about citizens' assemblies in particular is that it's a means of getting people who wouldn't normally participate in public decision-making around the table, right? But these are real people. And if you're gonna get them there, you've got to really do something with them. You've got to make sure that there's an outcome. So I think what you say is absolutely right. It's critical, I think. Thank you. And I think just to wrap things up, um, and this again touches on something that Graham was mentioning earlier about, you know, it's not just policy impact, but what what we might want to think about is, is culture change within commissioning organizations. And, and yes, how you evaluate for that is, is, is a minefield. But but there's a question from Jessica, which I think brings everything to a close, which is, is there any evidence emerging on what policymakers are learning from participating in the process? however tangential their participation might be. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any anything on that, even informal kind of reflections, Michelle, perhaps from, from conversations you've had with policymakers or, or how things have changed. But yeah, just to bring things to a close, what are, what are, what are policymakers learning from this? You can go first if you want. Um, I often just hear how valuable it was to, to um, be a part of these exercises and listen to the conversations that, um, that were had and the discussions and the debate. Um, I think policy, often policy makes are very removed from the populations that they serve. Um, and this provides an opportunity to really hear firsthand what the issues are and how to solve them. Um, so I've heard people say that they were really moved by the process um, and really shocked by the inputs um, and lots in between. So I think, um, yeah, I think it's it's a really kind of valuable um, process to be involved in, not just receiving the report at the end of it, but actually sort of being a part of it. Great. Yeah, and I, and I think what Michelle's pointed to is, is actually... Um, senior policymakers, whether we're talking about politicians or civil servants actually being present. Um, I think one of the problems that does happen is these things get commissioned and then it's something that happens over there that the policymakers kind of receive a report from something they don't really understand. I've, I've, never, I've never seen, been in a situation where um, a policymaker hasn't been impressed by what they've seen when they've come to an assembly. And I think for some of them, it is a real, um, Life changing is probably too much, but it's a culturally important moment when they realize actually citizens can do this work because for some people, they don't believe they can. And for other people, it's a matter, it's a theoretical idea rather than something they've seen in practice. So very often something like a citizens assembly can, can actually shift someone's into, you know, their kind of prejudices around what is possible. Um, and I think that there is a, it, it's kind of anecdotal evidence around this rather than systematic. But certainly you know, the, 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 the four or five assemblies that I've been personally involved in and had people visiting them, you know, they have been noticeably shocked about how well citizens have been able to deal with these issues. So I think overcoming some of those basically institutional and, and individual and professional prejudices is, is a really important part of this. It's a real moment, isn't it, when when people realise the capability that, that participants have. And I think there was that there was that paper that came out last year, wasn't there, that, that showed that, that participants in the Irish Citizens Assembly reached higher epistemic standards than than people in Parliament did, you know, people's ability to gra grapple with complexity. Um, but if there's nothing else from the panel, um, I think we'll bring it to a close because we've we've run over slightly, but there are some fascinating questions there. So thank you to everyone for taking the time to listen and to and to contribute. And it only remains for us to say, yeah, thank you for joining us this lunchtime um, for this conversation with Graham, Rod and Michelle. And of course, thank you to our amazing speakers for sharing their expertise and their experience so generously and, and for responding to all the questions. Yes, and just a quick thank you from me too. I I, uh, I couldn't I thoroughly second that. Um, and as for next steps, uh, there are two things to look out for. The first is that we'll be writing up our reflections on today's conversation and sharing these. 
Um, so look out for that. And again, this, we would like to, any thoughts that you have, we're really welcome. We really welcome them. And the second is that the next seminar that we're planning will be in September. So uh, watch this space for a date. Um, we're trying to plan a bit of a two-parter looking at the question of kind of deliberation for all. So that might involve some questions about how we might scale up or uh, widen the base of people who get involved in deliberative processes, as well as what deliberation in the future might, might look like or, or might hold for us. So um, look out for further information about that. Um, and we really hope you can join us um, and we'll be flooding your inbox. No, not flooding your inboxes. We'll be sending an invite out to you. So hopefully you can spot that then. Um, and all it remains to say is thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.